Permian Basin's 24-hour news leader. This is the Big Two News Update. In the car, think again. The Permian Basin Drug Task Force has it out for you. This man has found out the hard way, as are many others. The interdiction team with the Drug Task Force calls out its secret weapon during routine traffic stops. If there are any drugs around, this hound will sniff them out. This afternoon, he found a quarter pound of marijuana in Antonio Ruiz's toolbox. That's bad news for Ruiz and good work by the hound and the drug team. There's not a day, not a single day that doesn't go by on the interstate that we don't put somebody in jail for narcotics. We're finding mainly marijuana, cocaine, methamphetamine are the three main drugs we find. We find all of it. Those are the three main drugs, and out of all of those, it would probably be marijuana. This is what the task force does every day. A total of 1,000 drug cases last year, 600 already on the books for this year. The appearance of a new drug is not a good sign. It just adds to the organized drug traffic. My life was completely different when I was a police officer. I spent the first 10 years of my life in California because my dad was in the military. My dad moved myself and my brothers to Texas where I trained coon dogs, I trained cow dogs, I trained obedience dogs, and then later I went to the Kilgore Police Academy at the age of 21 and graduated with my peace officer's license. Fresh out of the police academy, 21 years old, like most 21 year olds, they haven't experienced certain tragedies in life, they haven't experienced certain triumphs in life, and uh, that's how I was when I was 20 years old. I was gung-ho, high energy, totally believed in what I was doing, but I was blinded in wisdom because of my lack of experiences in life. I spent four years as a police officer before being hired by the Permian Basin Drug Task Force. In those four years, I trained my own narcotic detector dog. When the Permian Basin Drug Task Force called me for an interview, I drove all the way to West Texas, which felt like halfway around the world to me. I had my dog in back of the truck, and when I arrived, my dog bounced out with a rope, not a leash, and I had a minnow bucket that I used as a watering pail, and my supervisors were thinking, oh my gosh, who is this country boy with a rope, a dog, and a minnow pail? And after hiding marijuana and showing how well my dog did, it kind of surprised them, and that led to them hiring me. It wasn't long, and I began to find loads and loads and loads of drugs. I couldn't believe working with the Border Patrol and the FBI and the ATF and the DEA, we'd get close to the border and we'd get on the interstates and we'd run search warrants and we would work undercover and it just never quit. It was constant. And later with that type of training, I switched and reversed and started seizing money and then I couldn't believe the cash that was leaving our country going into uh, Mexico from the drug traffickers. So I soon realized no matter how much I seized or how many arrests I made, I was not catching a fraction of what was coming through the borders. So I was sent to schools all over Texas that were taught by the DEA, the US government. In these classes, I was taught and trained that marijuana was a demon type drug. I really believed that marijuana was harmful and the people using the marijuana and the people smuggling the marijuana were just pieces of trash. And that was about the time DEA was launching uh, the cannabis eradication program where they were flying over and spotting marijuana fields from the air and uh, then sending ground troops in to eradicate those. In fact, I'm trained to fly in the air and spot marijuana fields. You know, I noticed the people that I was busting for marijuana use in particular were really good people. They never acted out. They never got violent. They were always cooperative in comparison to people I arrested for being drunk. You know, they would fight and scream and act crazy. And I started putting two and two together. The government's telling me marijuana is a demon weed. I'm arresting all these people for marijuana that are nonviolent, including getting in raid gear 
with 10 other grown men and guns, more guns than we would ever need, crashing into these homes, dragging the kids away, screaming with the parents screaming, everybody in tears. We're sending the kids to Department of Human Services. We're sending the parents to jail over marijuana. Well, I knew some of these people, and I knew they weren't gangsters. I knew they were nonviolent people. And then later on, I experimented with marijuana myself and then be began doing a lot of research. I learned marijuana uh, was safe, that it, you cannot overdose on marijuana. I learned that there were a lot less traffic fatalities on marijuana than there was alcohol. I just learned that the harms I was taught by the government were a total lie and they were false. And that's the moment when I started telling myself, this is not right. I'm believing my teachers without researching the facts for myself. Once I got the true evidence, then my conscience kicked in. The humanity in me, the compassion that said, oh my God, what the f am I doing? busting into these homes, ruining lives and ruining families. And then I remembered uh, uh, what I had read, Jimmy Carter's statement, that when the legal side effects of a substance cause more harm to the person than the side effects of the substance itself, we have an injustice. That totally made sense with me because I'm a logical, reasonable person. And I have to say, that was, a big, that was a big turning point for me. I was making so many arrests in Gladewater that the local drug task force was basically kicked out of Gladewater and they lost their funding because of a decision the city manager made. She thought, if Barry's seizing all these drugs, why do we need to keep paying a task force? So task force is gone. I made a huge drug arrest that uh, brought in a lot of money and three what they called bad guys at the time to jail and the DEA had been trying to catch these three bad guys for a long time. So because the local task force had to leave, DEA being jealous of me, it caused a lot of political pressure. When you put on top of that, I arrested a city councilman for a bag of marijuana and a pistol and the mayor's son for methamphetamine. It was just such political pressure. At the same time, I started realizing this injustice that I was part of, so I quit law enforcement and began building companies and selling them. After leaving law enforcement in the next 10 year span, I went through two divorces and was arrested five times. Each time I was arrested, I either got a not guilty or it was dismissed. I truly did not deserve to be arrested for any of these offenses. So here I am, ex-narcotics officer, put hundreds of people in jail, responsible for thousands of people being in jail in joint operations, and now I'm being put in jail when I shouldn't be, and I started seeing both sides of the coin. I know what it's like to have police raid your house. I personally was raided on a civil matter, not a criminal matter, where they were coming into the house to take my two daughters. My two daughters put up resistance to the point the police put bruises on them. My daughters were screaming, please help, please help, please help. There was nothing we could do. They decided the kids were not going to go, so they just left the house. Just like those eight, nine, and 10-year-old kids that I busted into their home 10 years ago, they still remember that and it still bothers them. The parents seeing their kids drug away, that hasn't left. They might be out of jail now, they might not be. But that trauma of having police enter your home uninvited puts a permanent wound, a permanent scar into the spirit and the soul of a human being. It's serious and it's sad. Now I'm 37 years old. I sold all of my companies, including a successful cage fight company that we started where we did uh, mixed martial arts shows all over the South. I needed another project to work on, but the next project, I wanted it to really help people. 
I put two and two together with my experience as a police officer. And then the last 10 years, the five arrests I've had, it got topped off when they put me in jail for not returning Jeepers Creepers 1 and Jeepers Creepers 2 on time to a video store. I was arrested for theft. Later the charges were dropped and I got my money back, but I still spent time in a jail with 20 other inmates because I didn't return DVDs. It was clear to me that our Fourth Amendment rights of unreasonable search and seizure or search and arrest were so eroded and the courts were doing nothing to protect my rights against these unreasonable search and seizures that I decided to do something about it by putting together a DVD full of information that nobody else wants to tell to protect ourselves from these unreasonable and crazy police arrests. The response has been tremendous. Sales went through the roof when this DVD hit the world news media. I have not stopped doing interviews. I have a national voice now to speak out and say what thousands of Americans in our prisons want to say but can't say. It is clear to me and it is becoming more and more clear to everybody, including law enforcement, that the punishments of marijuana do not fit the crime. For instance, in my state, if somebody's caught with as much as a marijuana roach in their house, upon conviction, they lose their driver's license for an entire year. Yet, in the same state, somebody can be convicted of child molestation, receive probation, and they never lose their driver's license. I also learned, according to the Center for Disease Control, that 18 million Americans smoke marijuana every day, and 42% of Americans from the age 12 to infinity have tried marijuana at least once. So that's almost half of the U.S. population. I don't believe that nearly half of the American populace belong behind bars. It's ludicrous, it's crazy, it's not right. So now my work is finished. The DVD is in your player. We're going to talk about canines. We're going to talk about concealing your stash. We're going to talk about search and seizure. We're going to talk about profiling. We're going to watch actual traffic stops of me arresting people for marijuana. And finally, if you didn't take the advice of all the above and you get busted, we're going to walk you through that also. Grab some popcorn and your favorite cold drink and let's get started. Bet you didn't know I was a chef. Welcome to the canine section of this DVD. I think the best way to explain to you how a narcotic detector dog works is by bringing you into my kitchen. Come on. The first thing I want you to understand about how a narcotic detector dog is trained is it is very simple to train a narcotic detector dog. The hard part is finding the right dog to train. Uh, we could look at possibly 100 dogs and maybe one out of the 100 qualifies for a narcotics detector dog. We look for a dog that has an incredible ball drive. All of you have seen this dog. Everybody hates this type of dog because when you go to the backyard they jump up on you, they tear things up, and they want to chase their ball over and over and they're just psycho about their ball. That's the type of dog we want to start with. Then the officer simply scents the ball or the toy with marijuana and the dog begins to believe his toy that he has this crazy drive to get smells like marijuana. See this pot of stew? Well, humans, we see carrots, corn, potatoes, gravy. We see all these substances, but we only smell one odor, stew. A dog is just the opposite. He can't see very well. He sees in shades of gray and black, and he cannot see 3D. He sees flat. So his eyesight is not good, but his nose is excellent. When a canine smells this stew, he smells corn, carrots, 
potatoes, gravy. So he can separate odors just like you and I separate the ingredients by sight. Knowing this principle that a dog can separate odors like humans see, you should be able to draw the conclusion that masking substances do not work. So to answer the age-old question, do coffee grounds mask the odor of marijuana? Absolutely not. I've had my dog alert on bricks of marijuana that were wrapped in cellophane, then layers of coffee ground, grounds, then mustard, then mustard, <laughs> there we go. Vanilla extract is common, bounty fabric softeners and pepper. If we place cannabis in there, remember the stew analogy? The canine can go, oh mustard, oh coffee, oh vanilla, oh bounty fabric softeners. Ah, oh, the marijuana and give an indication. So these substances do not work when it comes to trying to fool a canine. Oftentimes, people trying to mask the odor of marijuana use petroleum products, gasoline, things of that nature, or some kind of strong cayenne pepper because a dog's nose is very sensitive and when he comes across these items, his instant reaction is to jerk back. But that doesn't work either because we're trained as narcotic handlers to watch this type of reaction and when the dog makes it, it makes us suspicious. Okay, the question is often asked, how did the canine smell through the gas tank, through the gasoline, through the PVC pipes floating around in the gas tank, and, the, and indicated on the marijuana inside the PVC pipe. I'm going to explain that to you. The dog cannot smell through anything, but odors permeate. And the example I would use when I was teaching law enforcement principles of K9, I would get a Ziploc bag and I'd either get marijuana or tuna fish or sardines. And I would place them in the bag just like that and Ziploc it. I would pass this bag around to the entire class and tell the, ask them to smell it. You cannot smell the sardines at this moment. At the end of the class, I would pass the same bag around and a couple hours later, the sardines could be smelled, which brings me to this point. Everything is porous, including plastic. Under a microscope, there are microscopic pores. So the marijuana seeps through the PVC pipes, through the gasoline, through the metal gas tank, and there's an odor or scent cone on the outside of the gas tank for the dog to pass through. And then the dog goes, oh, gas tank. Oh, gasoline. Oh, PVC. Oh, marijuana. So dogs cannot smell through anything. Odors permeate out. Now the rate at which odors permeate is different with every container marijuana can be placed in. If I do not contaminate the outside of this Folgers cup with marijuana dust and it's completely clean and I drop the marijuana inside the coffee and place the lid on top. The dog will not alert on this item at that moment because the odor hasn't had time to permeate. Now how long that takes? I don't know. It's different with every item. It might be an hour. It might be five hours. So it's important to remember if you're going to travel with a few joints going down the highway and you're going to place it in a container place it in a non-contaminated container right before you leave and then the odor does not have time to permeate to develop a scent cone on the outside for the dog to alert. When a bag of marijuana is touched, microscopic dust is transferred to your hand. Whatever you touch after that, you're transferring this microscopic dust and the dog can and will alert. It was very common for my canine to alert on the door handle of the vehicle. 
So if you're handling marijuana at your house, or if you've hidden marijuana in your car and you have that dust and you touch your door handle, that canine will alert and then the officer has probable cause to search. So keep your hands clean because a canine drug dog also knows his handler's scent. And oftentimes if the handler hid his own marijuana, the drug dog would actually be alerting on the handler's scent instead of the marijuana. So we always handled marijuana with latex gloves. Let's talk about hiding marijuana in food. Remember what you've been taught? The dog can smell, ah, oh, hamburger patties, ah, oh, marijuana. But he can't communicate that to the handler. Hey, I'm smelling hamburger patties, and hey, I'm smelling marijuana also. So hiding marijuana in food is a good idea because usually when the dog reacts to it, the handler just thinks the dog is being interested in food. We've picked the dog that has this psychotype drive to find his ball. That's a prey drive. I found it almost impossible to get my narcotic detector dog to search for his ball when there was some other type of prey in the same area. For instance, a cat in the car, even if we removed the cat, the dog could still smell the cat all over the car and he was concentrating on where's the cat, where's the cat, not where's the ball. I would also notice it was impossible to get my canine to search for marijuana in vehicles if we were pulled over near a road kill. That's a wild animal or a domestic animal dead in the highway. I would have the driver move the vehicle ahead at least two miles so the dog could get that other animal or that other prey out of his mind where he could concentrate on searching for marijuana. So these deer scents and fox urines that uh, hunters use, it's a good idea to spray your tires with that. It's a good idea to carry a cat in your car if you're going to have a couple of marijuana cigarettes. This confuses the dog where his drive is channeled to chasing these things instead of looking for the marijuana. Let's talk about narcotic detector dogs false alerting. Remember, the canine thinks he's finding a toy that he's psycho about. He will do anything to get to his toy. Unscrupulous narcotic detector dog handlers have learned this. And they can, through voice commands, cause their canine to false alert. The type of commands that are often used are, Shh, get it, get it. Find it, find it. Good puppy. Because those are the same words we use when we're bringing the scratch drive out in our narcotic detector dog, meaning the dog has smelled an odor. We want him to indicate that to the narcotic detector dog handler by scratching. So to bring that scratch drive out, we encourage them, Psst, get it, get it, get it, Psst, get it, good boy, good boy, get it, get it, get it, get it, get it, get it. And once they scratch hard enough, we throw them their toy like it popped out of nowhere. So the unscrupulous police officer can use this when you've refused consent to search and he's walked the dog on the outside of your vehicle and you've made sure nothing's contaminated and the marijuana has not been in there long enough to permeate and he does not get an alert, he will often use that trick. Get it, get it, get it, get it. And the dog will raise up and start scratching. In the following footage, I'm going to show you a documented, trained, narcotic detector dog false alerting. Notice this Labrador hunting for the substance. Good. Show me. Show me. Good boy. Show me. Spot it. Yeah. Yeah. Good dog. That's called a false positive. There are no substances there at all, and the canine's indicating. It's clear and plain to see there are no narcotics there. Now watch, she'll continue getting the dog to alert, talking the dog into alerting. Remember this, it is not the dog's fault. It is not the dog actually lying. It's the narcotic detector dog handler that's causing the dog to lie.
Welcome to the Conceal Your Stash portion of this DVD. I've often been asked, why are you helping people break the law? The truth is, the law is already being broken. 18 million Americans smoke marijuana every day. 42% of Americans from the age 12 to infinity have tried marijuana at least once in their life. So it's clear the law is already being broken, and it's my mission to make sure these good, real American people that have families and have children do not make a stupid mistake by hiding a small amount of a substance that is impossible to overdose on in the wrong location and ultimately them winding up in a government cage. As you learn from the canine section, wear latex gloves when you're hiding your stash because the marijuana dust that's transferred to the glove can be easily thrown away and not transferred to the vehicle. Never ever conceal your stash on the exterior of the vehicle such as the gas cap compartment or the bumper. A narcotic detector dog can smell your stash really easy if you hide it in these locations. Never ever conceal your stash in plain sight such as the console. A police officer can spot that from the driver's window very easily then he has probable cause to search your car. You wouldn't believe the people I arrested that had joints laying in their ashtray. Never ever hide your stash in easy to find locations such as the glove box. When you're digging around in the glove box for your insurance card, an officer can spot plain sight stashes. And never ever conceal your stash in a small overnight bag like this. I know it's convenient that when you're packing to grab your stash and throw it in, but it's a mistake because cops can search through these really easily. It's a really good idea to hide your stash in hard to find places such as way under the dash. There's all kinds of crevices and places to hide small amounts of marijuana. As a successful interdiction officer, I would reach my hand in the dash to feel for a pound of marijuana, a large amount, but I would never take the time to look in every crevice for a joint. Remember, if it takes 15 minutes for you to hide your stash, it's going to take an officer at least an hour to find it, and that 15 minutes could quite possibly save you years in jail. Another good tip is to hide your stash toward the interior middle of the vehicle instead of close to the exterior. If we hide our stash close to the exterior, it's easier for a canine to detect this from outside the vehicle. Another really good idea is to conceal your stash as high as you can get it, such as the crevices and headliners of vehicles. It's hard for a narcotic detector dog to sniff up high. Another great place to conceal your stash is in your hand. I had an informant tell me that he never carried more than he could eat. He knew there was no way to overdose on marijuana, and if the red and blues lit him up in the back, he would simply swallow it. And remember, it's not illegal to smell like marijuana. It's illegal to possess marijuana. I learned another clever way to conceal your stash. When searching through vehicles, I would notice a small trap door cut in the floorboard. It didn't hurt the value of the vehicle, and the suspect would simply drop his stash through the trap door, and if I saw it, it looked like road debris. Get to know your vehicle. Every vehicle is unique in certain compartments that it contains. For instance, this vehicle contains a console that with some force can be lifted out and there's all kinds of neat little crevices in there to tuck a joint. Another great tip is to be creative where you conceal your stash such as inside a straw or inside a straw skin, throw it in the bag. The point is to be creative. And remember, I never ever arrested anybody for marijuana brownies or marijuana cookies. That is an excellent, safe way to travel with your staff.
Welcome to the search and seizure section of this DVD. There are three things that are vital that you must learn about search and seizure law. Reasonable suspicion, probable cause, consent to search. Let's concentrate on reasonable suspicion and probable cause. Reasonable suspicions are items or things that the officer observes that when all put together in a package one can reasonably be suspicious that you're up to some type of crime. Your hand being nervous when you hand them the driver's license, that's a very common reasonable suspicion, but it's not quite enough to indicate that this person is involved in a crime. Now if we put your hand shaking and then stories are not matching between the driver and the passenger, again, that's two reasonable suspicions. And all of these reasonable suspicions put together is going to cause him to interview you longer. It's going to cause him to ask you for consent to search. It's going to keep him at the scene longer until he can gain consent or probable cause to search your vehicle. A police officer can have 50 reasonable suspicions and he cannot search your car without your permission or a canine alert or some other probable cause. He can have one probable cause and he can search your car without your permission and you have to let him or he can arrest you for resisting a search or a seizure. He has to detect a crime is being committed in his presence through one of his senses. If he sees a marijuana seed, or if he smells marijuana, or if a canine indicates the odor of marijuana, he has probable cause to search your vehicle and there's nothing you can do about it. The goal of this section is to help you eliminate as many of these reasonable suspicions as we can, where there might be only one or two instead of 10 or 15. Did you notice all of the items scattered throughout the car? Each one of those items was either reasonable suspicion or probable cause. Let's go back to those items and I'll explain to you which is which. Did you notice the marijuana leaf on the key ring? Okay, it's not illegal to have this, but that's a reasonable suspicion. I can reasonably suspect that you're a pot smoker when you have this type of paraphernalia. Did you notice the rubber bands on the gear shifter? To an untrained eye, those are just rubber bands. To an interdiction officer, these rubber bands mean, mean to me you might be smuggling money because narcotics money is often wrapped in rubber bands. You would not believe the millions of dollars of marijuana I seized after noticing a roach in the ashtray. That's probable cause to search and you're in trouble, so keep this out of your ashtray. The second probable cause was this marijuana pipe. Now this is considered a tobacco pipe if it hasn't been used, but if he can see charred ash and smell that marijuana has been smoked in that, now that's drug paraphernalia and now it's probable cause. And then don't forget, if they find a marijuana seed laying in the floorboard, that's like seeing a pound of marijuana in the floorboard. It's just as good for them and gives them probable cause. I would check in the creases of the seats because I knew people rolling marijuana cigarettes often drop the seeds right down between their legs and they wound up in the crease. Rolling papers are a reasonable suspicion. Remember one of the first places a police officer is going to look is the glove box. So keep all reasonable suspicions out of this area including rolling papers. It's no secret I'm a fan of high times but guess what? reasonable suspicion. So if you're going to travel with the High Times magazine or any other cannabis magazines, keep them hidden and out of sight as well. Scales are not illegal to have, but with all this other stuff in here, that would make the interdiction officer think that you are a marijuana dealer. So stay away from this kind of stuff. I love pointing out these reasonable suspicions because that's what separated me from uh, being just a normal interdiction officer to one of the top interdiction officers, I noticed everything. Look at the clear plastic baggies. You know, this is indicative of narcotics dealing. Again, they're not illegal to have, but they're definitely a reasonable suspicion that will keep the interdiction officer at your car longer. Okay, let's talk about the beer. 
If you're not old enough to possess this, and there's somebody in the vehicle not old enough to possess it, that gives the officer probable cause to search for more alcoholic beverages. And upon searching for those alcoholic beverages, if he finds your stash of marijuana, that's a legal search. You're in trouble. So if you're underage, don't have this in your car. Did you notice the two shaving cream cans? That doesn't make sense. Men have one shaving cream can, most men. And of course, we all know these have hidden compartments in them. So uh, if you're going to carry one of these, carry one of these. I've already taught you what reasonable suspicions and probable causes were. Let's talk about consent to search. You've heard your entire life, refuse consent, refuse consent, refuse consent. I don't recommend that. You're free to do whatever you want, but I recommend quite the opposite. If you've hidden your stash in a hard to find location, like taught earlier in this DVD, give the officer permission to search if he asks. Here's why. 100 times out of 100, when somebody refused consent to search to me, they always had something in their vehicle they did not want me to find. It was usually drugs. Sometimes it might be a Playboy magazine or something of that nature. But there was always something they did not want me to see. Law enforcement officers know this. Even though you have the constitutional right to refuse consent, when you refuse, it raises a huge red flag. You could almost call it a huge reasonable suspicion. Upon refusing consent, that officer automatically knows now you have something to hide. If you simply say, go ahead and search my car, he's probably going to make a quick cursory search and then you'll be on your way. If you refuse consent, he can do a weapons pat down search of your vehicle without your permission and upon patting the interior of the vehicle down for weapons, if he finds a marijuana seed or a marijuana pipe or something of that nature, or if he smells marijuana, then he's going to search your car without your permission. If you refuse consent to search, he's liable to get a narcotic detector dog to walk around the outside of your vehicle. If that dog fails to alert, as you learned in the K-9 section, he could quite possibly cause that dog to false alert. Then you have no choice. He will also invite numerous other police officers at the scene the call goes out on the radio. I've heard it a hundred times. I have a refusal. I have a refusal. And police come from everywhere to figure out how to get in that car and then they begin a real detailed search. So remember, if your stash is hidden well, like taught to you in this DVD, my recommendation is to give permission to search. Welcome to my former office, the Highways of America, where I work narcotics interdiction. Narcotics profiling is defined as the method used by law enforcement officers to highly increase their chances of making a narcotics arrest based on visual cues and indicators prior to the traffic stop. I worked on the interstate, but I want to take you first into the city, the actual city where I cut my teeth and made over a hundred arrest on less than five miles of highway. Come go to the city with me and then we'll come back to the interstate. This is the exact intersection that I spent two years where I made over 100 narcotics arrests. This is a small town with less than 2,000 people. There were two types of uh, people that I would uh, profile. I would look for what I called user drugs and then smuggler loads and we'll show you in this section what would alert me to believe somebody was just a simple user or what would alert me to somebody being a smuggler. As you can see this traffic coming behind me and these cars turning the intersection, I would sit here, they were forced to go slow because this is an intersection and that would help me get a really good look, bird's eye view of the occupants and the vehicle. 
So if you ever see a patrol car sitting perpendicular at an intersection and he's watching cars real closely going by, one of two things is happening. He's trying to interdict people for narcotics or he's gotten a bolo, a be on the lookout dispatch to him of possibly uh, somebody that was involved in a gas drive off or some other crime. While I'd sit at this intersection, I, I didn't like stopping the people that lived in Big Sandy. You know, I was trying to catch the larger loads going north and out of towners with, with marijuana. So if they weren't familiar with this intersection, if they weren't from Big Sandy, I could tell by the way they navigated this intersection. They would be somewhat confused and uh, they wouldn't use their turn signal or they'd get in the wrong lane and I instantly knew they weren't, they were not a local person. Okay, now this white SUV coming through here looks like a Tahoe. Uh, he's not using a turn signal and I noticed it was a single male Texas plates probably from out of town, but his age, he was a lot older. It just didn't strike me as, as somebody I would stop. There's a black male and black female in a Lincoln. That car is interesting to me. And again, this is not racist. Uh, I, I arrested more white people than I did blacks. My record's clear on that. I am absolutely not racist. There are racist police. I don't care what they tell you, that they've had the training, that they're not racist. They are racist. Not all of them, but a big majority of them are. They do pick on black people and Mexicans, period. I've seen it with my own eyes. That's still happening today. At this time, I'd run a license plate check. And, well, no, I wouldn't need to. There's a CarMart sticker. I know CarMart is a local car dealership. They have one in Longview and Tyler, but they also have one in Arkansas. Speaking of stickers, if you had a dare sticker or a say no to drugs sticker, that alerted me to you. And you would not believe the people I arrested with those type of stickers on their cars. Cops do not trust people, period, because they get lied to every single day. Pretty soon, after two years of nothing but lies, you could be telling them the honest truth and they don't believe you. You have to prove yourself innocent and that's unfortunate instead of them proving you guilty. They automatically assume you're guilty. Now that was a white female. At first it looked like a white male with long hair. White males with long hair, I stopped them all the time. Hair like mine, I would have stopped me. They won't, they won't smuggle in a really nice vehicle in case uh, they get busted. There's not a nice vehicle for law enforcement to seize. So we're going to catch up to these two. He navigated that turn very well. I need to get closer to the vehicle and start reading bumper stickers, license plates, things of that nature. And again, I'm at a disadvantage because I'm in a Suburban and not a patrol car. If I were in a patrol car, I would have them really nervous right now. They just bobbled that line. That's enough for me to initiate a traffic stop. But at this point, I actually wouldn't. I'd watch them for a while. If you can zoom in on that sticker up on the corner, the rear window, if that is like a DPS, we support DPS troopers sticker, we donate to, to some kind of law enforcement agency, that is a heavy indicator to pull them over. Any support of law enforcement that they're advertising automatically makes me suspicious. And I'm starting to feel that same adrenaline re being released into my body and that's what kept me going in law enforcement. When you ask a cop, why do you want to be a cop? Or why are you being a cop? Or why are you working narcotics? Their answer always is, I want to help people and I don't want drugs to get into the hands of the kids. That's all bull crap. They're out here doing this because of the adrenaline rush. They're actually drug addicts themselves. If I injected you with adrenaline certain doses every day and all day long like a cop gets, you would become addicted to that adrenaline and need more and more and more and more of it. That's why we have to elevate ourselves to da more dangerous things to get that rush of adrenaline. When you first break out of the academy, riding a tr simple traffic ticket, your hand shakes and you get that adrenaline rush. Well, after 500 riding tickets, 500 times riding tickets, it's no longer a big deal to you. So the next thing, you need disturbance calls to get that same adrenaline rush. Then you need fights, then you need car chases, and what happens without law enforcement recognizing it, this happened to me, 
I needed so much adrenaline, the only thing that pumped me up were, were busting people for narcotics, fights, and car chases. When you find drugs on somebody, you're supposed to handcuff them right then. Well, I would leave the cuffs off of them and say, you're under arrest for possession of cocaine and give them a chance to run or to fight because that gave me that adrenaline rush that I needed because I was addicted to the adrenaline. Interdiction officers, narcotics officers, are not out here to help American people and they're not out here to keep drugs out of the hands of school kids. Drug dealers are not dealing drugs to your 10-year-old on the playground. For one, 10-year-olds don't have any money. For two, 10-year-olds are not doing the drugs. That's all a government ploy. Oh, they're killing our kids. That's a lie. That's just a good thing to say. That's just a mask to hide behind the, the, the cruel and unjust war on drugs. It's absolutely not true. Cops are out here doing this for the fame of it and for the adrenaline rush and for the peer acceptance because after there's a big drug bust there's a big party and that officer is considered a celebrity for that moment Working the interstate is much different than working in the city. Remember in the city when I could park my car at an intersection perpendicular to get a good look at the vehicle and the occupants? I can't do that on the interstate, but I'm going to show you the techniques I used where I could get a good look at the vehicle and the occupants. You would either sit on the shoulder of the road and watch the passerbys, or one of my favorite things to do is what I called slow roll. You've seen officers do this before. I would be in the right-hand lane, and I would slow down to 40 miles an hour. So if you ever see a law enforcement officer slow rolling, wanting cars to pass him, that's probably what he's doing. There's somebody without a front license plate, a van, Florida plates. Those are hot tags. That van is large enough to carry large amounts of marijuana. Now my goal is to get up beside the uh, van and look at the occupant and that is just, he's an older man I'm not interested in him young man in his 30s driving that kind of van that would look odd to me I would light him up okay these guys I would consider users I would automatically assume they were a pot smoker you know they party they would definitely be pulled over if I were looking for uh, somebody that I thought was just a user. And I have jailed many, many users, unfortunately. So remember, narcotics flow north and east because they come from Mexico. The money rolls south and west. Uh, my supervisors, after they saw all the narcotics I was seizing, they called me in the office, asked me to switch sides of the highway and start looking for cash. We needed the cash to stay in existence. And I, I could earn my salary for an entire year in one traffic stop. Then everything else I seized after that was for dogs, guns, patrol cars, other officers' salaries, things of that nature. I was working in Odessa on Interstate 20. The, the population of blacks was very low, not anything like East Texas. Blacks with dreadlocks and New York license plates came uh, rolling through I-20 out in the desert. I lit him up. He got out of the car. He said, what's up, man? I almost told him, get in the car. You're under arrest. Hot target right here. Running disabled vet tags. My father is a vet. My brother is over in Iraq fighting the war. However, a lot of the Vietnam uh, uh, soldiers that fought in the Vietnam War they became addicted to heroin and things of that nature. It's, uh, everybody knows there were a lot of pot smokers over there. Nothing wrong with pot smokers, but when I was a cop, a disabled vet tag meant Vietnam veteran to me. He fought for our country, but it didn't bother me a bit putting him in jail. I was wrong. Corvettes are just cop magnets. Happens to be one of my favorite cars. 
uh, the wealthier people own them. As that woman passed me, she was wiping her nose. Me, as a narcotics interdiction officer, I would automatically assume she's been snorting coke. They would be a, a person of high interest. They're driving a Corvette. So if I catch cocaine in there, I get to seize that vet and my bosses love me. If you'll notice, there are vehicles riding low in the back, so their trunk's either full of luggage or it could be full of a lot of pot. You see how it's riding low in the back? I got a 300-pound marijuana arrest simply because the van was squatted down in the back. And that's a, a single white female with Michigan tags. She had glasses on and she just didn't look like the partying type or the risky type. She looked a little more reserved. She mo looked like a librarian to me. So nothing about her interests me. I noticed the Dodge uh, car ahead of me uh, occupied by black people. Then this car is occupied by black people. A lot of times narcotics traffickers follow each other. Somebody will follow the load car to make sure the driver of the vehicle with the load doesn't steal the marijuana. So two vehicles traveling down the interstate with simi similar occupants in the same lane lights me up. I would stop both of them and they're switching lanes in and out together which would indicate they're following each other to me. Trooper just sitting there in the rain, he is not working narcotics interdiction because it's unsafe to sit on the side of the highway like that. So remember that, in the rain you're a lot safer than if it were a sunny, nice day outside. Uh, interdiction officers just will not get out in the rain and search, search people. It, you, you have to get occupants to stand outside in the rain, the officer gets wet, it's just no good for anybody. So. You know, if you want to go to your uncle's house and you've got a joint and want to get there safely, go in the rain. Uh, I loved to work in pairs where I could radio ahead or my partner could radio to me. Hey, Barry, I'm on a traffic stop, but I just saw two white males with long hair pass by me in a 1992 uh, red Lincoln town car. They're at mile marker 114 and uh, they'll be approaching you in the next 10 minutes and I would get in a pit position to wait for them. When they would go by, I would get behind them, wait for them to, to bobble and pull them over. So we would work in pairs. Okay, Louisiana tags rolling west. Two young white males, this would be a money load. I, I, I'm thinking they're carrying money to Dallas to buy drugs to carry back to Louisiana. Now get a good shot at these two white males. See their age group? They're younger. In fact, he is rolling a joint in his lap right there. Lift up your camera. They're wondering what we're doing. If we were police officers, I would have them pulled over and they would know what we were doing. Okay, now see, that's a good example of what not to do. Do not drive down the highway rolling a joint. If I were in a marked patrol car, of course he wouldn't be there rolling that joint. But he never even looked up for a long time. And then we looked up, they were surprised. Here we are making this DVD and wham! There are two young men, probably really good people, that could ruin the rest of their lives because of a stupid mistake. Isn't, isn't that a college sticker on the back? Uh, some kind of uh, sorority, fraternity? Okay, marijuana smokers. College kids and fraternities smoke marijuana. What do we have in the back seat? Two females and two males. Yeah, these are college kids. Okay, yep, I would have pulled them over. Good group of kids, getting an education, not harming anybody driving down the highway, probably have a little pot, and uh, here I was ruining their lives. The important thing to remember if you are carrying marijuana in your car, you want to blend in with the flow of the traffic. Travel when rush hour is high and there are a lot of vehicles. You want to look like everybody else. You do not want to stick out. I'm lit up on this truck pulling a boat. And what's bothering me is the boat does not look like it's been used. I would pull this vehicle over and then my first question to the driver away from earshot of the passenger, I would ask the driver, have y'all been fishing? And if he says yes, I know he's lying. Because notice the Texas tag on the, on the uh, boat, but Mississippi tags on the truck. So that automatically makes me think he drove from Mississippi down here to pick up a load of marijuana. They had the boat rigged with hidden compartments already loaded. It's got a Texas tag and he's pulling it back to Mississippi. 
Sometimes we can drive too careful when we're trying not to get pulled over. Don't drive too careful. Drive like everybody else. Drive normal. Don't do anything to cause attention to yourself. If a police officer does pull up beside you to look in your car just like I did, don't look straight ahead. Look, I want to look over so bad, but I'm not. Don't cut your eyes at him like that. He automatically knows you're up to something when you do that. You just look over at him like normal and look straight ahead like you would anybody else. I know that's hard to do, but do it. Jesus fishes light me up just like I support my local police department sticker or say no to drugs sticker or dare sticker, a Bible in the car, that type of thing, that just makes me even more suspicious. This is what profiling is. It's what law enforcement officers do. When they look at you, they automatically start judging you in their head and categorizing you into what classification of criminal you might or might not be. That's what profiling does. We take in all these visual indicators and process it through our minds based on our experiences and our prejudices and then we draw a conclusion on what we think that human being is based on just what we see. I know it sounds crazy, it's not right, but that's what's happening. Okay, I don't want to take valuable time on this DVD to walk around a vehicle and explain to you how your lights need to be working, your license plate needs to be securely attached and all that stuff. You already should know that. Make sure everything works on your car, but remember this too. Your car can be in perfect order. You cannot make one single traffic violation, and if an interdiction officer wants to stop you, he will lie and say you failed to maintain a single mark lane or something else like that. So don't count on good driving and a car being in good shape as keeping you out of a traffic stop. In this section, you get to watch me make actual narcotics arrest caught from my dash mounted patrol camera and you get to see the mistakes others made, so pay close attention. In this traffic stop, you'll see that I pulled over a single white male traveling with two white females. He made the mistake of having a marijuana roach in his ashtray in plain sight. I could also smell the odor of marijuana reeking from the vehicle. That was my probable cause. That's all I needed. Had he not been smoking in his car, had he not had a roach in plain sight in the ashtray, he wouldn't have went to jail. Also notice in this traffic stop where I catch the lady passengers in a lie. Okay, notice right when he got out of his vehicle, he's touching the back of his head. Nervousness, hand-to-head -head contact. Don't do that. Sign of deception. Where are you headed? I was just trying to come out here. Sir? I was just trying to come out here. Just come back to college. Okay. You don't have a driver's license? Nope. Who's in the pickup with you? Uh, a couple of my friends. Stand right there a minute, be right with you. Smell alcohol on his breath real strong. He's kind of unsteady on his feet. We as police officers know when somebody lights a cigarette, they're usually trying to mask an alcohol odor or a marijuana o odor. Uh, it's definitely a sign of nervousness also. Can I get you to stand over there by my headlight for me? Now I'm splitting the driver up from the passengers to try to get a mismatch of stories. Notice I lean way in the vehicle. Have a driver's license on you? I'm smelling for marijuana right there. I don't know. Okay. 
Y'all been drinking tonight? Huh? I haven't. What's making your eyes so red? Okay, have you had anything to drink tonight? Where y'all from? At this point of the traffic stop, when I asked them about the red eyes and I've already leaned into the vehicle, I've already smelled marijuana. They don't know I know that, and I continue my line of questioning. But in my mind, they're already got right now. So just because a police officer doesn't arrest you right then doesn't mean he hasn't already spotted something. Okay, right here I'm approaching him. I'm about to confront him with the marijuana. Marijuana roach in the ashtray. And I smell marijuana. Never put palms up. That's another sign of deception. Keep your palms down. Okay, where's the marijuana at? I ain't got any. Do any of the ladies have any on them? No. Just from a friend of mine today. Earlier today, how much, have, how much, hang on just a second, stand right over here. You're under arrest for public intoxication. I'm not going to DWI you. Okay, that's fine. That's going to save you some money. <laughs> now, how, these two ladies in here been smoking weed too? No. Don't lie to me. I ain't lying to you. Their eyes are awful damn red. So now I'm approaching the truck to talk to the ladies to try to get a mismatch of stories and to see where the marijuana is. And you'll hear that I lie to these ladies to try to get the truth. Ladies, any y'all got any marijuana on you? No, sir, you can check me. <laughs> no. There's marijuana roach here in the ashtray. I like the way marijuana smells. He told me y'all had smoked some weed with him. Now, how much weed did y'all smoke today? This is the only one we have. That one joint? I didn't, I, I didn't smoke that one. One hit, that's it. Your eyes are awful red. I don't think it's just from being tired. I, I've only got one beer. That's it. Okay, a while ago you told me you didn't drink any, so oh, you're, you lied to me. That's because I'm scared. I understand that. Keep your story straight. If you're going to lie, keep the same lie. Don't change it. In this traffic stop, you'll see I pulled two white males over. I noticed a weird gas tank underneath the uh, old pickup. It was an aftermarket gas tank. So this was a profile stop, and upon speaking with the driver, I could smell the odor of the burning marijuana coming from inside the vehicle, and another roach in the ashtray, plain sight search, led to his arrest. If he hadn't have been smoking pot in the car, if he didn't have evidence in plain sight, he would have saved himself a trip to jail. Good evening, sir. See your driver's license? Hey, could you step out of the vehicle for me a second? See the hand-to-head -hand contact? Same as the first driver. Don't do that. I don't care how nervous you are. Quit that. Hand-to-head -hand contact. Big deception indicator. Going to Kilgore. Now, I pulled this vehicle over, noticed the gas tank hanging low. I thought I might have a smuggler, and they put some crazy gas tank in there with 10 pounds of marijuana. Okay, is this your buddy in here with you? I separate the driver from the passengers like I did in the previous traffic stop to check their stories, to make sure their stories match. That's really important that one of you is not going to Oklahoma and the other one's going to Indiana. Or one of you came to Big Sandy to get beer and the other one came to see their aunt. And notice I'm leaning in the window really far again while I'm talking to the passenger. And you're going to notice I ask the passenger for the insurance card in the glove box. Usually the passenger does not know where the insurance card is, and he'll open everything and dig around and look, plain sight, for an officer to see. A copy of his insurance in the glove box. Is that it right there? Okay, you mind opening the glove box for me? Okay, what, what kind of uh, cigarettes do you smoke? Marlboro's. Marlboro's? Is that the only kind you smoke? Go ahead and stand right here. Is that the only kind you smoke? Yeah. Did you see? I asked him, is that the only kind you smoked? And he walked away. He was nervous. He heard me. He didn't want to answer the question. The best thing to do when you're answering questions from a police officer, look straight at him and answer the questions. Don't be evasive. I saw something in your ashtray. I'm going to take a little better look at it, okay? It looks like a marijuana rope. 
I'm gonna take a look at it and see what it is, okay? Now I'm, I'm almost place. sure that's a marijuana roach in the ashtray. So remember, police officers are asking you questions for a certain reason. Go ahead and pull that ashtray out for me if you would. This traffic stop I made, single white male driver, headed north. He was running a paper tag. Paper tags are high profile targets to narcotics officers. It's oftentimes uh, narcotics traffickers, instead of registering a vehicle in their name, they'll just run a paper tag. So that alerted me. And then notice, right when I pull him over, he gets out of the vehicle and starts walking toward me. Don't do that. Stay in your car. Anytime a driver would hop out of their vehicle real fast and come straight to me, it made me think there's something in the car they didn't want me to see. And you'll notice that's what happened in this traffic stop. There was something in there he did not want me to see. See there? Road testing and demonstration only. Yeah, it is. Do you have a copy of your insurance? Uh, no. He, he didn't put no insurance. Okay, check in the glove box for the registration. Just started today. Hold on, hold on, don't, don't move. It was a pistol in the glove box. I couldn't tell if he's reaching for a pistol or something else, but it got serious. Step out. Stand right up there for me. You don't have a weapon on you or anything, do you? Okay. You knew it was in there. Well, I didn't pull out. Okay. I did put it in there. Okay. Stand right up there in front of the vehicle. I forgot all about it. Yeah. Got any more weed in there besides that little one hit pipe? Sure. Is that it? I yeah, you got some weed in there. Come here. He had a marijuana pipe in the glove box with a handgun. We can win this battle and get marijuana legalized without showing any violence at all to law enforcement. So remember, do not carry guns. You ever been arrested before? What for? Yes, what for? What for? Oh, marijuana. And where's it located? Um, in your sleeping bag. In your sleeping bag? Okay. All right. Is that all you have? This next traffic stop you see my partner made on two white males traveling together. They made a lot of mistakes. They had marijuana hidden next to a felony. LSD. 800 hits. Find it, find it. Good puppy. No. We see that he throws the marijuana while the officer's not looking. Don't carry marijuana on your person where you're in that position where you have to try to throw it. That's not the time to get rid of the marijuana. After arresting these two individuals, my partner reviewed the video and saw where he had thrown it. He went back to the highway at the exact location and recovered the evidence. Don't forget, video cameras are watching you. You're both under arrest for possession of marijuana and for possession of LSD. Okay, no, listen, listen guys, y'all stand right here. I'm going to get your statement of rights out. I'm going to read your rights to you, okay? Now that LSD is going to be a felony, son, here in Texas, okay? Need your camera. There are a lot of dynamics to this next traffic stop. Three white males traveling westbound on Interstate 20. At first, I thought I had a small marijuana seizure. Later, we discovered a large amount of cash. There I go, leaning way in the vehicle again. Now, at this point, I've already smelled the marijuana. Now I have all the passengers putting their hands on the seats or the dash. If an officer ever makes the passengers put their hands somewhere, he's alerted to something. Something's bothering him. I'm issuing a warning citation here. The Supreme Court has ruled that once a citation, whether it be a warning citation or an actual citation, has been issued and signed, at that moment the driver is free to leave. He can leave right then. Well, when we ask for permission to search a vehicle, it's important in court for us to be able to testify 
we asked permission to search at the time the suspect was free to leave. Then there's no coercion factors involved. In other words, I'm not saying, can I search your car and the driver's still wondering am I under arrest or not? That can be very intimidating. So remember, once the citation is given to you, you're free to leave at that moment. You can walk away. I've already smelled marijuana, but I want permission to search at the same time. I looked for four or five legal ways to be inside your vehicle so I had an airtight case. I have probable cause because I smelled marijuana and in a moment you'll see me get permission to search his vehicle. James, we're with the Drug Task Force. We're out here looking for narcotics, large amounts of money, stolen property and weapons. We look for marijuana. Have you marijuana in your car? We've been smoking weed in that car. I smell it all over you and I smell it inside that car. Look at it while I'm talking. Okay, notice here I'm being very intimidating. I mention and accentuate the fact that I'm looking for narcotics, specifically marijuana. I want him to wonder, does this guy know I've got marijuana? Because between me and the dog, we don't miss nothing, brother. We don't miss a marijuana seed, a rose, a quarter bag, a pound, we don't miss nothing. That's not true. Dogs do miss narcotics. Most people think a dog is a super human type instrument that law enforcement uses that can never fail. Dogs fail more often than not. You mind if I search you? Square up with me, James. Square up with me, bud. Okay. You lied to me. I'm going to put you in jail, bud. Here's your rolling paper. Now where's your weed? Huh? James, I can tell you're lying. <laughs> Is this your marijuana? Is this your marijuana? You don't think that's marijuana? It smells like marijuana, it looks like marijuana. You see James continues to lie. Listen, you are under zero obligation to tell the police you are committing a crime. You have the right to remain silent. Use that right in your favor. They both told me you've been smoking weed, right? Would you submit to a blood test? Would you have any THC in your blood? When I could not get them to admit to smoking marijuana, like you notice this passenger is doing, I mention a blood test. The only time they can draw blood from you is with a search warrant or if you're involved in a traffic accident with serious bodily injury. You would believe the number of people that would admit to smoking marijuana for fear of me drawing blood from them. Not any weed in any of these bags back here? Now, I know we have a criminal case, possession of marijuana, small amount, misdemeanor. I want you to notice how attitudes and my partners and I demeanor completely changes when we locate the $33,000 cash because it's switching from a criminal case to a civil case. We want that money. We want an airtight case. We want to seize that money and not make any mistakes for our commander. How much is it? They are no longer allowed to talk to each other after this point. We want to seize the money. It's really easy to seize property, a lot easier than to seize a human being. To seize a human, we have to have probable cause to the extent we believe we can prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. To seize money, it's a preponderance of the evidence, meaning we only have to show 51% why we think that money was gained through illegal activity. So now we're interviewing everybody. Now where did you say you were coming from? And the questions never stop and they just dig a hole deeper and deeper and deeper. This next traffic stop is a classic profile stop. I stopped this vehicle running a paper tag traveling west on the interstate occupied by two Mexican males. Actually, I was searching another vehicle when I saw it pass. 
I put down what I was doing and chased them. I pulled them over for going 68 miles per hour in a 65 mile an hour zone. Where y'all coming from? Okay, now right here, the driver's confusing me. He's having a hard time explaining whose car it is. His story was that he was going to El Paso, was going to drop the car off and fly back to Oklahoma. He shouldn't have said that because that is exactly how traffickers work. They get the load vehicle to a certain location and they either take a bus back, another vehicle, or an airplane. The reason I stopped you, I checked your speed at 68. I'm not going to rack you any tickets, okay? okay? Yeah, thank you very much, sir. Okay, I'm with the Drug Task Force. We're out here looking for narcotics, weapons, stolen property, large amounts of money. Mucho Did you notice he's free to leave? I told him I was not going to write him a citation. That's the same as writing him a citation at that moment. He's free to leave. Large, large amounts of money would mean ten thousand dollars or more in cash. See, people are taking large amounts of money that way to buy narcotics and carry it back to Oklahoma City. Can I search the car? Notice me shaking the spare tire. I lift the spare tire up and shake it. I know these guys have something. I just don't know where it is yet. We ultimately seized ninety-five thousand dollars out of hidden compartments in this vehicle. They had a duct tape tied where the far packages you could just pull them out with the, like a rope. And the passenger side rocker panel totaled $29,995 for a grand total of $94,995. The driver and passenger stated that they don't know where this money came from. They don't want it. They don't want to have anything to do with it. Another great profile stop. Single Mexican male traveling east on the interstate. The way I knew he was up to something, he said he was driving the car to a gas station and he was going to leave the car and then he couldn't explain how he was going to get home. Whether he was going to walk or his girlfriend pick him up. I'm with the drug task force. I'm looking for narcotics and weapons. Do you mind if I search your car? Is that okay? okay? Go ahead and pop the trunk for me. What is this? How long have you owned the car? Huh? At this point in the traffic stop, I already have detected a hidden compartment. I just have not opened the trap door. If I open the trap door and see the contraband inside, at that time, I have to read him his rights. The reason I take a long time before I open the trap door is I want him to answer every incriminating question he can and it's admissible in court because he is not under arrest at this time. Do you have a Phillips screwdriver in the car? My screwdriver did not open the trap door, so I asked him for a Phillips head screwdriver. He went straight to the glove box and pulled out a Phillips head screwdriver that fit perfect. It's common for smugglers to have the tools in the vehicle that they need to access their hidden compartments. That little bit that he did really hurt him in court that he knew right where the tool was to get that trap door open. Okay, the packages you see now is what we took out of the false compartment. This is suspected marijuana. This is what the trunk looked like when I popped it. I instantly noticed the trunk was not deep enough. I pulled this part out. This is a compartment molded to fit in the trunk. On the back of the trunk was this trap door. Like that. I unscrewed the trap door and inside was all of the gray packages containing suspected marijuana. The gentleman was arrested for possession of marijuana. He will be booked in Hector County Jail. I stopped this van, single white male, traveling east, Interstate 20, rental van, 
and it was squatted down in the back. I could tell it was carrying something heavy. Rental vans are high profile targets to narcotics officers because it's common for traffickers to rent a vehicle to transport their narcotics in. That way if they get stopped you can't seize their personal vehicle. You can't seize a rental car. Notice him getting out and approaching me hand to head contact. Notice me following him right into the van. There I am nosy again leaning into the vehicle trying to smell. 300 pounds of marijuana in the rear of this van and I never smelled it. I think the reason I never smelled the marijuana is they had it heavily, heavily wrapped in cellophane and in large duffel bags. I think they had wrapped it the day prior to hauling it. Had they wrapped it and waited a week, the odor would have permeated through the cellophane and I would have smelled it. Okay, notice I wrote him a traffic citation. He's free to leave. He tells me he's coming from El Paso, going to Dallas, two major cities. A lot of it coming from El Paso going to Dallas. Yeah. Do you have any of those items with you? you mind if I search the van? Yeah. That'd be okay. He then advised there's approximately 270 pounds of marijuana back here in the duffel bags. The cardboard boxes also have bricks of marijuana in them. He's arrested and he'll be booked into the Vector County Jail for uh, aggravated possession of marijuana in violation of the drug tax stamp. Another great profile stop, if you want to call profiling great. 18-year-old single Mexican male traveling west, Interstate 20, coming from Odessa, going to El Paso. He explains to me that he's driving the car to El Paso for his uncle. All of those were indicators that he was up to some type of criminal activity. Why are you going to El Paso? Oh, how long are you going to be out there, Lewis? We run a narcotic detector dog around this car. He alerts under the car. I crawl under the car. And I noticed the gas tank bands were not lined up properly, and there were tool marks on the bolts that held the gas tank. When I asked the driver had the gas tank been removed, he said no. Well, I know that's a lie because I saw the evidence of the gas tank being removed and that led us to the $25,000 cash hidden in a false compartment inside the gas tank. that we thought it would have. Compartment runs all the way back to there, so this does not hold much gas. And I'm disappointed to figure there'd be more cash than that. Didn't you? This is what it's all about. Two busts in Odessa on consecutive days, a third in Sanderson on Tuesday. And it's evident that the task force's highway interdiction unit is running at full speed. So you got busted. You are not a bad person because you got caught with marijuana. Even though our laws say you're a criminal at this point, you're not. The first thing to remember upon being arrested is close your mouth. A short while ago I stopped this van for a failure to maintain a single mark lane and you understand that you're under arrest for possession of marijuana, aggravated possession of marijuana. You understand that? Okay, need a verbal response. Yes, okay. The marijuana that we located back here, does this belong to you? No, it doesn't. Okay, do you know who it belongs to? No, I don't, have, I don't know his name. Don't know his name? No. Okay. Did you know that marijuana was in your van? Hey, yes, sir. Yeah, I knew it was. Okay. Why did you let me search your van if you knew it was full of marijuana? Search it anyway. Okay. Well, that's not true. That well, might be what you think. If you had well, told me that I couldn't search, I'd have just ran the dog around the van, yeah, and then you saw what the dog did. Or got a yeah. warrant. Yeah. And once the dog alerts, then we right. can search it. Police officers are not your friend, period. When they tell you, you have the right to remain silent, and anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law, they mean that. 
even the most innocent statement, they will twist around to mean totally something else and testify to that on the stand. Beware of hidden tape recorders and video cameras in the patrol car and in the booking room. Pretend everything you say and everything you do is being recorded. Be nice. Offer zero resistance. Even though you feel like fighting and you're so pissed off because of the injustice that's taking place, you keep your temper calm and make sure you don't catch another charge by resisting arrest. Furthermore, actually being in jail can be one of the most stressful experiences of your life. Be prepared to be fingerprinted and photographed. Remember, don't lose your confidence. And when you're placed in a jail cell with other prisoners, the best thing to do is just stay to yourself. The key here is to make sure there's been a bond set. Continue to ask guards and booking people, what is my bond? They will give you all the phone calls you need, not just one, but they usually give you all the phone calls you need to contact a bondsman who can post your bond to get you out of jail. Hiring an attorney can be a tricky business. My recommendation is to hire an attorney that has courtroom experience, meaning he tries cases and does not just plea bargain your case out or has a history of plea bargaining cases. A plea bargain is simply an agreement between your attorney and the prosecutors, who are attorneys also, to get you to take a lesser sentence for a plea of guilty. My recommendation is to always plea not guilty jury trial. Say it costs $5,000 on a misdemeanor marijuana case to hire the best attorney. That $5,000 you spend will save you so much money in the long run because if you get convicted and you have to do time in jail, you will not be able to go to work to earn any money. And remember, if you do get convicted, that conviction will follow you around the rest of your life. If you're caught with marijuana and you're placed in the patrol car and you still have marijuana on your person that you did not tell the police officer about, tell him at that moment and go ahead and give it to him. If you walk into the jail with that marijuana hidden on your person, it turns into an automatic felony. If you're already busted, go ahead and give him what you may have hidden on yourself. My critics will never believe this, but this is the absolute truth. Myself and NeverGetBusted.com's central driving force is love. Myself and members of my team have had jail experience, and we know how horrible and how disastrous it can be we know the tragedy that it caused our families. So we know how millions of Americans feel that have been arrested for marijuana. 750,000 people this year will go to jail for marijuana. And out of this love, we've produced this DVD to keep you from being put in that position. The process of this DVD was really hard for me because it brought back a whole lot of memories of the families I destroyed, watching the old footage of those marijuana arrests, how cocky I was, and how rude I was to good people. That hurt. I'm okay. I'm okay by it. But I just want you to know my heart and the heart of NeverGetBusted.com is truly centered around love. Join our mailing list at NeverGetBusted.com and do everything in your power to never get busted again. We're out here on the highways of America where I had 